So welcome everybody. It is my huge pleasure to, um, to, to welcome Aubrey Cunnington to the lecture series organized by the Pediatric uh, and Child Health Center at Imperial College. And this is part of a lecture series that we hope will be also available online afterwards. And Aubrey is going to talk to us about emerging infectious diseases. So over to you, Aubrey. Please do save your questions for the end and we'll take them um, at the end of the talk. Many thanks. Over to you, Aubrey. Thanks very much, uh, Gareth, and welcome to everyone that's joined. It's really nice to be talking to you today. Okay, so we're going to uh, go through emerging infectious diseases at some pace. The aim and objectives of this are to, to really give you an overview of emerging infectious diseases, to understand what types of infections emerge, what defines an emerging infectious disease, and what drives the emergence of infectious diseases. And then we'll have a look at quite a few uh, case studies of recent emerging infections, which have had catastrophic consequences. There'll be no prizes for guessing at least one of the things we'll be talking about briefly. And um, to consider what can be done to limit the emergence of infectious threats in the future. So a definition to start with, what is an emerging infectious disease? So we're talking here about the recent appearance or detection of a disease in a population or the amplification of transmission of a previously rare pathogen that either increases its incidence, prevalence or geographical distribution. So just to give some examples of those, um, we might call Lyme disease an emerging infectious disease because its incidence has been increasing over time um, in the US. And indeed, Gareth will tell you in the, in the UK. Um, West Nile, which was not detected in the US until around 2000 and then emerged in, uh, in, in the US. Or we might call dengue an emerging infectious disease because although it's been prevalent in um, Southeast Asia for a long time, um, it spread and emerged in South America. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. So some different patterns that you could see that would meet the definition of an emerging infectious disease. And just to illustrate this uh, concept that infections can re-emerge as well, we could think about measles where there was a substantial change in its epidemiology within Europe, a lot more cases um, from 20, in 2018 relative to 2017 with dramatic um, number outbreaks in, in some countries. And that would be classified as an emerging disease as well. All right. Um, so just to illustrate with a few, few cases, a bit more some vector-borne diseases transmitted by this rather beautiful Aedes mosquito and dengue is a great example of this. And you can see from the maps here, um, the distribution of dengue virus uh, changing over time from 1980, um, where it was predominantly Southeast Asia, and then um, spreading rapidly into um, South America till there's a really uh, big burden of uh, dengue virus, all four dengue types being described there. And another virus that's similar to dengue causing a fever, <coughs> arthralgia and rash syndrome is chikungunya virus and a similar pattern um, that this virus has uh, spread um, through different countries and emerged most recently in South America um, where it's become quite common. And then up until a couple of years ago, um, the most topical emerging infectious disease was Zika virus. Um, and you probably all remember all the news stories about the babies being born with microcephaly. And that was because, again, Zika virus transmitted by these same Aedes mosquitoes emerged in an area where there hadn't previously been infection in, in South America. And a lot of people became infected because they were all susceptible. And uh, there was this epidemic of uh, microcephaly as a result of uh, infections occurring in pregnant women. What types of infection emerge more generally? Um, well, if you look at this uh, map 
uh, you'll see lots and lots of different types of infection and it might seem quite difficult to, to categorize them initially. But in fact, the majority are zoonoses. And zoonosis means an infection which comes from animals and nearly two thirds of human infectious diseases arise from pathogens which are shared with animals. And in the last 70 years, zoonoses have made up the vast majority of emerging infections. So this relationship with animals is very important and we'll talk more about this um, throughout uh, today. Why do zoonotic infections emerge in the first place? Well, there are a variety of factors that lead to um, spread from wild animals into domestic animals and then into to humans. And this might involve um, proximity of these groups in a way that wasn't, didn't previously happen. It might involve vectors which enable the, the transmission. Um, and it might involve factors associated with density of animal or human populations. But essentially, um, for something to, trans to, to spill over from a wild animal reservoir into humans, often it goes through an intermediate in domestic animals. And there are a number of things that we have done to our planet, which have increased opportunities for zoonotic infections to emerge. Um, so these include changes in environment, um, our interaction with animals, particularly wild animals, changes in climate and global warming particularly, and then the fact that uh, transport networks enable rapid spread. And those are themes that will recur. So first stage of an emerging infection is often pre-emergence. And this is where um, there is this spread from a wild animal reservoir into domestic animals. And a good example of this is Nipah virus, which you may well not have heard of previously, um, but this caused quite a significant outbreak of disease uh, in Southeast Asia in around the 2000. And what happened was that the environmental conditions were created that favored transfer from its natural reservoir in bats um, to domestic animals, in this case, pigs. And so there was intensive farming happening there were orchards to grow fruit, which attracted the bats to come. And there were pigs which were being grazed in the uh, ground underneath these orchards because they were quite good at picking up the fruit that fell to the ground, a good way of feeding the pigs. But this meant that the bats, especially the fruit bats that came to feed on the fruit uh, were in proximity to the pigs. The pigs acquired viruses from the bats, from bat droppings and so on. And then the farmers of the pigs started to develop this strange encephalitis and respiratory syndrome, which was identified as the virus. People have constructed networks of pathogen sharing between uh, animal species, and these are quite astonishing actually, um, to think about that there's so much sharing of uh, zoon here zoonotic viruses between different animal species. And you see really, um, highly connected at the center of these hubs, you have um, lots of domestic animals which can share viruses from, from wild animal species. Um, and so when we then contact, are in contact with the more domesticated animals, we can pick up viruses that have come from animals that we would not usually have contact with. And as I mentioned, there are lots of things we're doing that's that are driving this flow of pathogens between wild uh, animals, wildlife, and livestock or peri-domestic wildlife. So these include things like the what we eat and the increasing demand for intensive farming for animal protein, other intense agricultural practices which um, alter the natural environment, the use and exploitation of wildlife, whether that's people wanting them as pets or to hunt them, um, but coming into increasing contact with them. Unsustainable utilization of natural resources such as uh, deforestation um, and mining, which destroy large swathes of natural environment for animals and force them to move perhaps closer to humans. 
our travel and transportation, which also impacts on the, the contact with um, each other and these animals. And then um, climate change, which again impacts the particularly vector species um, and the proliferation of many intermediate species, um, which can, can transmit these viruses. So a couple of, um, sort of real life examples of this. One is Plasmodium nolzi, which is an emerging uh, malaria parasite. It's a zoonotic parasite. Its natural host is long-tailed macaques um, in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia. And what has happened uh, and been, been quite nicely observed through a variety of studies is that um, deforestation has forced the macaques to come closer to human populations, which they would normally shy away from. And then um, that has enabled more transmission by a mosquito vector from the macaques to humans of this parasite, which can cause fatal malaria um, in humans. So that, that's quite a well studied example of where um, ecological change has contributed the emergence of a, an infection in humans and the number of cases has, has actually um, sort of steadily increased. People have tried to look at the factors that predict emergence of infection and um, it's actually very difficult to do um, but you, you can do this to some extent and then apply predictors of emerging infection events to uh, looking at the globe in order to identify where you think the hotspots might be of emergence. And I suppose in some cases there, there won't be much surprise here to see um, some hotspots in, uh, for example, West Africa, India and Southeast Asia. Um, the ones that are a bit surprising in, in Europe are um, actually explained here because they include um, reporting in amongst the things that contribute to emergence because it, it's identification of emergence as well. And so the UK probably isn't a hotspot for generating new emerging infections, but it might be a place where there's more chance of them being recognized. So I talked about pre-emergence, but what do we need for this to then go a bit further and really start to spread into the human population? Um, and in order for that to happen, to have this localized emergence in humans, you need to have human to human spread and you need to have chains of transmission. And that, um, it, it can be distilled down to thinking about the R naught. And we've all heard a lot about the R number um, and various iterations of it in more or less scientific terms as our um, government has used the, the R scale to describe our management of, uh, or response to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. But here you can see uh, just some little infographics illustrating the concept of the R number. The average number of people that one person uh, with a virus or, or indeed um, other infections will infect in a totally susceptible population. So that's the important bit of the definition that we're talking about in a totally susceptible population. And um, you'll see that this R0 varies between different pathogens or just to show it a bit differently um, here you're probably familiar that the most infectious uh, disease that we, we really know of is measles with a very high R0 and then you can see others on a, a scale there. There may be some surprises there for example a lot of people are, are surprised to see that Ebola virus only has an R0 um, between one and two for example. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But R naught has quite a big impact on your epidemic curve. And this is some modeling done very early in the um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. And what you can see is that with different estimates of R naught, you see over time, over quite a narrow time window, just three months, what difference it makes if the R naught is uh, 1.9 or 3.1 in the number of cases that you will have at the end of that period of time. So then the next question is, if we have localized emergence, um, a virus has a, an R0 greater than one, which is what it needs to be able to, to propagate, 
um, what turns an emerging infection into a blockbuster. Um, and I don't know whether any of you have seen this film, Contagion, um, but it's, it's actually quite worth watching because um, it really does portray a nightmare scenario. Maybe wait a couple of years till the pandemic has gone, gone away before watching it. But um, this is, this is uh, all the things that could turn an emerging infection into a blockbuster. So you need to have sustained transmission, um, which is facilitated by the ease of spread. So that's often respiratory or fomites, which means that the, the pathogen persists on inanimate ob objects. So that might be because the droplets, respiratory droplets have fallen onto them and uh, contaminated them. You need to have chains of transmission and you need to have dissemination. Um, so those chains of transmission depend on people coming into contact with each other without any measures that interrupt the transmission. And dissemination um, depends on how easy it is to spread it around the world, which in part depends on where the infection emerged. So we can think about all of these in the context of some real emerging infections. And the first one I want to talk about briefly is Ebola. So this now seems long forgotten uh, with the current pandemic, but we were all very worried about Ebola back in uh, 2014 and the West African outbreak and what it might mean for um, our own countries, as well as the population of uh, West Africa, who in, in this area took a very, very heavy toll um, from this Ebola outbreak. And you can see where it was focused in some of the poorest countries in uh, West Africa. Ebola virus um, has a natural reservoir in wild animals. Um, fruit bats seem to be the um, sort of uh, natural host of it, and then it can um, spread from them into a variety of other uh, wild animals, which are believed to include some small deer species and primates, and then um, into humans, uh, often from events where they're in contact with the secondary hosts like the um, the, the uh, small deer and the primates, which may be captured as bushmeat and eaten. Um, but if the human host gets infected, then spreading it person to person through unprotected healthcare workers, through traditional funeral practices and through um, informal carers, you will come into contact with infected blood and body fluids. And all of these have been shown to play a significant role in in transmission of Ebola. And actually, um, it's possible to predict where Ebola outbreaks may occur based on the distribution of the natural host in its zoological niche. So these three rather pretty fruit bats live in these areas of Africa. And um, if you map onto that, where there are human populations of significant size overlapping with them, um, you can predict where the outbreaks may occur and they actually mirror quite nicely where outbreaks have occurred. And the Ebola epidemic was traced back to an index case in a small village um, called Meliandu in Guinea um, by a team of CDC investigators who went and did uh, the kind of outbreak re response investigation. And they were able to find that um, there was a the first case was a small child actually who was infected in this village. And this child had a history of playing in uh, the center of this burnt tree, which was also a roosting ground for bats and was probably the most likely place where they acquired the infection and then spread it onwards. As I mentioned earlier, Ebola has a lower um, R naught value than you might expect. And actually, um, when you have an R0 value that isn't very much above one, um, there's quite a lot of chance involved in whether sustained chains of transmission are set up. And this has been simulated to predict the, the average size of outbreaks of um, Ebola. And um, you can see here the kind of predicted outbreak sizes and the uh, West African epidemic was actually, I think, the 12th recorded outbreak of Ebola. And um, it was had been predicted that only about one in 12 would occur on that sort of scale. So a bit spooky, but um, 
that is the how the, the statistics work out. There was a lot of excitement about what might happen in terms of the potential for international spread, um, which uh, led to some modeling studies predicting the potential number of imported cases into different um, countries in the, in the world um, based on air travel out of uh, these uh, affected countries in West Africa. But I think what these studies really neglected to address was the population that was being most affected by Ebola, which were the predominantly the poorest people uh, in these countries and many of whom had no uh, chance of being able to, to um, undertake international air travel. And the Ebola epidemic was contained by reducing that R value below one, which means that the pandemic or epidemic dies out, transmission, uh, each case is um, transmits to less than one other person, so it will eventually die out. Um, primarily by public health measures, which meant um, isolating people suspected to have infection and then uh, preventing the opportunities for them to transmit to others. And we know that although it was a really tragic epidemic, it did uh, ultimately come under control through good public health measures. So we can contrast that with a different pathogen, SARS, and this before um, COVID, SARS was the, the main uh, coronavirus that people were, ha, had been very worried about. And um, it's one of many coronaviruses that, it, that exist, and quite a few of them infect humans, as you can see in the middle of this figure. Um, but SARS-CoV or SARS-CoV-1 was the SARS virus, um, which again came from um, a zoonotic um, transmission to humans, although in this case, we suspect we do know the, the uh, origin of it. And this caused predominantly very, very severe respiratory disease. And it spread globally quite rapidly um, during the course of the epidemic, partly because of where it arose. Um, so in China and then spread to Hong Kong, um, and there was much more opportunity for, for travel. Um, but this came under control quite quickly. And you can see here a timeline of the SARS epidemic, um, which really ran from, although the first cases were not really identified until um, retrospective analyses looked for them, um, concerns were really only being raised in February of 2002, and it was all over by July 2003. And although SARS was very dangerous and um, more transmissible than uh, Ebola, it was possible to control it because um, it was very easily recognizable um, and people could be isolated. So as soon as we realized that people needed to take um, really uh, strong infection control precautions, healthcare personnel needed to have um, really high level PPE, then it was possible to contain the infection and prevent it further spread. And it was these lovely little civic cats that were implicated in the spread of uh, the SARS virus, um, but it originated in, in them. Viruses have been found in these civic cats that differed from those in humans by just two amino acids. Um, and these coronaviruses are RNA viruses, which have a, a predilection to, or, or an ability to mutate quite easily because they lack proofreading mechanisms that are seen in DNA viruses. So they develop a lot of mutations as they evolve and these may well um, result in the ability to better infect a new host and jump between species. So quite different scenario here for an emerging infection, rather than um, it being uh, a, a, a pathogen which is spreading. Um, in this case, we're talking about one where um, it's people that were bringing a, a new pathogen with them and um, result, a lot of people moving resulting in an increase in the population. And this is um, a slide uh, that was shared with me by a colleague in Munich um, showing uh, when there are a, a huge number of um, 
migrants um, moving across Europe and Munich was an end destination for many of them. Um, and in this case, uh, they saw quite a number of people who had um, really nasty infection, which they didn't seem to find, easily find a pathogen from fever, sometimes shock. And then on the blood film, they noted something quite interesting. And you can see uh, if you've got sharp eyes that there are these little wiggly marks on there, which look a bit like they might be scratches on the lens. But if you look closer, you can see that these are actually spirochetes um, within the blood. And this was um, louse born relapsing fever, or Borrelia recurrentis, uh, which was the, um, a problem that killed a lot of soldiers in the um, interwar or, or around the, the world wars. And all of these travelers who arrived in Munich with louse born relapsing fever had all taken the same route across um, uh, Africa um, and had probably been in pretty rough conditions where they had been, uh, in, uh, where these mice had started, uh, lice, sorry, lice, not mice, had uh, been able to infest them and then uh, they had become infected with last born relapsing fever. And so the outbreak of cases was not related to local transmission here, but due to just the arrival of lots of people who had come through the same route and had all been infected on route. But the biggest emerging threat, I think is easy, is easy for us to forget at the moment in the face of COVID, but this will probably go on much longer than COVID. And this is me with some of my colleagues standing outside the building that I'm talking to you from now, um, underneath uh, the plaque commemorating that this is where Fleming discovered penicillin. And the scary thing was that in his Nobel lecture, Alexander Fleming warned that it was not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin and that people would die as a result of bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics in the future. And sure enough, we are seeing that now. And um, you will all be aware that antimicrobial resistance is a major global threat. And there've been all sorts of um, scary graphics like these showing the spread of highly resistant organisms around the world the proliferation of them, uh, or, or at least their detection in the UK, and the, the lovely, uh, almost um, resistant bacteria top trump cards produced in a, a CDC document um, showing quite how scary they are and what they may uh, do in terms of contributing to the death uh, in the, the US. And I think we all recognize that this is a problem that's going on. If you really want to um, convince yourself about uh, what's been happening. Have a look at uh, the ECDC, that's the European Centre for Disease Control and Surveillance uh, website, and they have some lovely um, interactive maps of antimicrobial resistance around Europe, and you can see how the proportion of resistant bacteria has changed over time in different countries um, by different bacteria and resistance to different antibiotics and um, it's not good news. And this is not only because of our injudicious use of antibiotics in healthcare, but often, a lot of it is driven by use of antibiotics in um, agriculture and farming and um, those antibiotics entering the food chain and then entering humans and then coming with people into hospital as well. So it's not just a case of us doing good antibiotic stewardship. We also need to address this threat of antimicrobial resistance through um, wholesale changes in the, the way that um, we look at farm animals and interact with our environment. So I can't do this talk without mentioning COVID-19 and many of you have probably seen the Johns Hopkins dashboard, but this is uh, a snapshot from yesterday evening uh, with this staggering total that there are now more than 3 million deaths due to COVID-19. Um, a vast number of cases, uh, but the good news is that a lot of doses of vaccine have been administered now around the world too. And you'll have heard a lot about this pandemic, but it's, it is quite useful to reflect a little bit on, on it. Um, 
the world was not particularly late to recognize it. I think um, actions were taken within a fairly quick time scale after the first uh, reports coming to the attention of the WHO and um, countries starting to worry about it. But um, the odds were really stacked against us in terms of being able to control the, the pandemic. Where did this virus come from? Um, so we still don't know the definitive answer to that, but it's related to uh, viruses that infect bats and pangolins. So it probably has um, a, a wildlife reservoir and um, something will have favored that transmission from um, animals into humans. And I think this uh, article sets it out quite nicely that uh, there are potentially lots of possible things that may have uh, allowed that crossover to happen into humans. We don't know that it was definitely due to this wildlife market that has been, been uh, repeatedly implicated in the, the media. Um, and it may have been circulating for some time in, uh, the, in Wuhan or the Hubei province of, of China prior to the first cases um, being identified. And I think that will all come out in due course um, that we may learn more about whether it had, had been there longer than we initially thought. And really, even before cases were being recognized, there was already amplification probably happening locally in Wuhan. Um, what we know now is that um, not all case, not all infected individuals would have manifested in the way that the initial case definitions were made. So not everyone would have had severe disease. There would have been a range from asymptomatic, mild, moderate, uh, right through to severe disease. And uh, so lots of it would have gone under the radar of um, being detected. You can see here some of uh, the, the early days of the pandemic and just how fast cases went up once people started looking for them though. And by the time um, WHO had really um, named this new disease and started to get very worried about it, there was already a huge number of uh, cases that had occurred in Wuhan. And in fact, had been disseminated really all around uh, China by that point. And probably not just that, but um, because of things that were happening, unfortunately, uh, just by coincidence around that time, there were a number of festivals and other things that were resulting in really large scale travel um, and mixing within and then out of Hubei province. Um, this probably resulted in a lot of worldwide dissemination happening um, before we had really realized what was going on. And even by um, 20th of February um, last year, when we were still only really wondering what we should be doing about it in the UK, um, there was already virus that was um, widely disseminated around the world. And really that explains why we have not been able to contain this very well. And we'll come back to that maybe at the end. So preventing the next pandemic, what can we do to stop this sort of thing happening again? Um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we should be on the lookout, whether we should be proactively trying to identify pandemic threats before they emerge. And there are lots of methods that have been developed over time to enable this to happen. But really, I think um, the, the sort of genomic methods and the cost of doing genomic sequencing um, allow us to do this in a way that would previously have been totally impossible. And you'll have seen the contribution that um, the kind of UK genomic sequencing effort has made to identifying variants of concern uh, with um, SARS-CoV-2 and how, how important that has been in really understanding what's going on and why we might get um, new variants that can transmit more readily and whether we need to change our, our strategies. Um, but all of these are applicable to trying to identify um, new emerging infections as well. And for quite a long time, the US government funded a big program called the Emerging Pandemic Threats 
programme, which focused on these hotspot areas where it seemed pandemic threats would be most likely to emerge from, and tried to adopt a One Health approach looking at viruses uh, that were present in the animal reservoir that might um, potentially transmit to humans. Now, it seems ironic that this scheme was actually mothballed or its funding ended and was not renewed just before, uh, a few weeks before um, the SARS-CoV pandemic uh, started. But whether it could have prevented it or not is a bit of a moot point because the PREDICT program um, looked, you know, it did an enormous amount of good work. It built up huge capacity building in 60 countries around the world. It identified a whole lot of novel viruses from a huge number of wildlife samples. But only one of these was proven to be a zoonosis um, on a very small scale. And the problem is that the only way to really tell whether any of these will develop into a, a zoonotic pathogen in humans is to observe that happening um, because they've all got the potential to undergo mutations that, that could allow um, crossover between species, but you never know when that's going to happen. And so um, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, I think. So other strategies to preventing the next pandemic um, are things that are uncomfortable reading for us, I think. Um, early detection, forecasting, yes, all very well if we can do it. Rapid response, definitely important. Um, being able to have those control operations in, uh, poised and ready to go um, to contain infection before it can spread rap, um, extensively within the human population, but tremendously expensive to be continuously prepared to implement that very quickly. And I think what I want to sort of end up talking about a little bit is um, how probably we brought in some ways the, uh, this pandemic on ourselves and will have brought future pandemics on ourselves by the way that we have abused our natural environment and um, that the only way to really stop or reduce future pandemics is probably to change the way that we, we human beings behave. So this is the conclusion of a big UN environment report published last year, which is that um, prevention and proactively is probably better than reactive strategies. And the anthropogenic, that's human driven um, drivers of emergence of new infections um, need to be tackled. So that's reducing our consumption of animal protein, moving to more sustainable agriculture, and decreasing the way that we use and exploit wildlife, sustainable utilization of natural resources, um, and land use in a way that will not drive um, an increase in opportunities for transmission of zoonotic infections rethinking travel and transportation, um, rethinking food supply chains so that everything is, is much more local rather than needing to be um, transmitted around the world and tackling climate change as, as well. And those are all things that um, require us to make large scale behavioral change. So in summary, um, there are an awful lot of uh, emerging infectious diseases and most of them are, are zoonoses. They often occur because of changes in the environment and because of changes we've imposed on the environment. Sometimes they are very complex changes, but mostly it's our fault as humans, I'm afraid. There's now a lot of global interest in identifying and predicting threats, um, and we can see that's going to be necessary to prevent huge health and economic consequences if there were more pandemics like the one we're experiencing at the moment. And preventing future pandemics will really need a change in the way that we interact with the environment and with animals. And I'm going to stop there to take questions. Aubrey, thank you very much indeed. What a great talk. Um, I, I had a major crisis in the middle of that because I think because of the weather, my um, internet connection went down. So I hope that did not interrupt the recording, uh, which was hopefully just happening in the cloud. So I questions.
It would be lovely if, if any of you want to ask Aubrey now. Uh, I think we, we do have a chat, so you can type them in the chat if you want to. I'm looking at Yeah. That. I mean, Aubrey, well, one of the really curious things was that you, you, you made that statement that SARS-CoV-1 was easily recognizable and therefore not difficult to isolate and contain the cases. And I mean, the, the virus has undergone a really critical mutation, hasn't it, in terms of the coronavirus that's caused COVID-19 in pre uh symptomatic infection is that is that the main is that one of the main drivers that why we did so badly with COVID-19 compared to SARS-CoV-1? Well I, I think um I think probably very early on we didn't realize you know the case definition was of a severe respiratory illness very much like SARS wasn't it initially and because that's what was being reported in China that they were having clusters of this severe respiratory illness, they didn't find a cause for it. Then they, when the virus was identified, they could show that that was there. But what wasn't known at that stage was um, about the, the fact that there were asymptomatically infected individuals or individuals with very mild illness as well, and that there was this whole spectrum. And of course, if you're not looking for those individuals, you can't stop them from traveling and transmitting. So. Yes, the, in China, the kind of lockdown that happened was remarkably effective there, but it was too late to stop dissemination, which had probably already happened even before the first case definitions of um, this virus were, were made. So we were always playing catch up, I think, and, and way behind the, the curve. And I think yeah, that, that sure. how could you get around that? It would be really, really difficult um, to, to ha have any strategy that was sustainable to, to have picked up a pro, a, the, the sort of mild end of the spectrum. Sure, but, but I think the interesting question is, is, is why the same was not true of the SARS-CoV-1. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, potentially because it had um, you know, a couple of uh, mutations that were associated with human infectivity, but I think also with perhaps with, with severity, so perhaps being able to um, find to lower respiratory epithelium as well, I think was one of the things. Um, and so that might be why it was causing in many people severe disease, but I don't know, Gareth, I'm speculating a little bit. There. So, so Aubrey, there's a question about the, um, the effect of climate change. I don't know if you want to um, add to that. You obviously did touch on it and yeah. I have to say I'm pretty interested because I think it is in, I think there's pretty reasonable evidence that it's affecting tick populations now yeah. across Europe and, and in the UK. What, what, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, tick-borne diseases is a great example where climate change has had uh, an impact. Um, and it's, but it's not as straightforward as that, you know, warmer conditions favour survival of ticks because it's, it's actually a much more complex interaction with the different um, hosts of the, the virus at, in the zoonotic reservoir, uh, or sorry, not of the, the virus, but for the, for, um, let's say for Lyme disease, or I guess equally for tick-borne encephalitis as, as, as well. Um, that um, the, there's also an impact on mammalian host populations um, with, uh, of, of um, warmer temperatures. I think it's been clear that climate change has favoured um, spread of mosquito vector populations into places where they previously were not surviving very well, they live a bit longer than they can transmit. Many pathogens in mosquitoes have to uh, undergo some sort of repetitive cycle within the mosquito or a developmental cycle within the mosquito and the mosquito has to survive long enough for that to happen um, and mosquito lifespan is often closely related to, to temperatures and in colder conditions mosquitoes don't survive long enough for that to, to happen so there are a couple of examples where climate change has either direct or indirect effects on the, the vectors. Yeah thank you thank you very much uh, are there any other 
last questions for Aubrey. I think it remains for me to say, well, Aubrey, that was a really fascinating uh, and, and thought-provoking tour of emerging infections. And I really do thank you. And this will go up on the website as soon as we can get it sorted out. And we continue to uh, have a couple more lectures in the series. And I hope that uh, well, we'll keep publicizing that. All the best, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gareth. Have care. a great day. Bye, Bye everyone.